Well, it's great to see everybody in church today. I want to start with a question. Is anybody fired up to be in the house of God today? Come on, put your hands together. Make some noise on every campus, every location. Uh, those joining us online, the men and women of the Alabama Correctional Facilities and another audience, the on-demand audience. And I don't know when that may be, even years from now, you'll join this message. We are so glad to have everybody with us. Come on, one more time, church family, put your hands together. It's awesome, awesome. And I am so excited to be here today. Just the thought that, you know, God has brought all of us here together for a purpose, for a reason, that no one is here in the sound of my voice by accident today is just a massive thought about our God. So I say, come on today, we lean into that and we trust God uh, to speak to us today. And that's exactly what I'm believing is gonna happen. And God's been doing that in some pretty amazing ways all year long uh, here at our church, including this past weekend at Together Women's Conference. Come on, ladies, make some noise. Awesome. Just incredible reports of what God did over those three days. And we had two conferences uh, that God really just moved in, in big ways. My wife came home yesterday just sharing so many stories of what happened. And this is just worth celebrating. We had 11,935 women join from 35 states and five countries. That's, that's insane. That's amazing. And, and ladies, you're here today. We just, we honor you. And I, I do want to just lean in for a moment. Uh, there's a lot of conversation in the world right now about, about women and what it means to be a woman. And I'm, say, I'm thankful for Proverbs 31 that says, a woman who fears the Lord is worthy to be praised that your mouth is filled with kindness and wisdom, that you are clothed in strength and dignity. Come on, church, put your hands together and honor the women of God of this house. It's incredible. Just honor you. And uh, we're excited just to continue with what God is doing today. We are in week two of a collection of messages that we're calling, Let's Talk About It. And I love this because all of these messages are, are driven from topics that, that we requested back at Easter. And so these are really important topics for a lot of reasons. One is they're obviously very relevant to each of us. We're the ones that have asked for these topics, which is huge. And really all of these topics are big cultural conversations right now. And so last week, Pastor Chris hit a message on stress. So powerful, powerful. if you missed it, go back and watch it. Uh, next week, he's back with a message on anxiety, which is so important. Do not miss that one. And then we're gonna have messages around forgiveness, and the Holy Spirit. And really, here's the deal. All of these messages are a chance for us to form or build our faith around topics that the world is talking about. And faith formation is huge. And this is kind of our goal for this whole collection of messages is that we would know, believe, and live the truth. That we would know what we believe, that we would have it deep in our hearts, have faith for it. And come on, somebody, that we would not just have it inside, but that we would live it on the outside. And that's our goal. It's kind of brick by brick. God continues uh, to build our faith. And so today is really an important topic uh, for us to hit. And honestly, if we're gonna make it in any of these other topics, we have to recognize that anytime we take a step forward in our faith, we're gonna face some resistance. And so today we're gonna talk about a huge, huge, huge topic in scripture, spiritual warfare. Come on, look at somebody and say spiritual warfare. This, this is a big one. And this is one that oftentimes we may, may, maybe, especially I did early on in my faith, feel a little bit uncomfortable talking about. Uh, but we're gonna go there today because the Bible has a lot to say about spiritual warfare as God equips us uh, to live the life he's called us to live. And so I wanna start with a C.S. Lewis quote, which is always a, a good thing to start with. This is what he says. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors in which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves, the devils, the demons, are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. And so from the very outset here, what the Bible's telling us is there are two extremes and we don't wanna be on either one of these. There's the, the human reasoning, materialist, like scientific mind, like there's an answer, a, a human answer for every problem end of the spectrum and we don't wanna be there. And then there's also, some of y'all have met somebody on this other end, there's also kind of the super mystical kind of end of the spectrum where everything's about a Ouija board and Bloody Mary, come on, the Denver airport conspiracy, come on, Smurf cat, come on, young people, where are you at? I mean, whatever it might be, all right? That there's like this demon under every single rock, all right? So we don't wanna be on those extremes. We're gonna trust God's word today. And I am so fired up today. Oh, y'all, I am so excited for this message because God has so much to speak to us if we'll get out of the extremes and get right in line in the perfect balance with God's word. So if you got your Bible today, open up to Ephesians chapter six. 
We're gonna hang out for the entire message between verses 10 and 20. And we're gonna allow God to speak to us today. I mean, literally, I could barely sleep last night. I feel like we're all in Highlands College today. All right, y'all ready for this? All right, if you got your app, note, be sure you get your notes out. There's a lot I feel like God wants to speak to us. And so structurally today, I'm gonna kind of lay it out this way. We're gonna talk about the three foundational truths of spiritual warfare and then the three essential practices. So we're gonna know what we believe, we're gonna have it deep in our heart, and then we're gonna make sure before we leave today, we know how to live it out, all right? So here's our first foundational truth, and this is a big one. I wish it wasn't true, but it is, and that is we have an enemy. We have an enemy. This is what Ephesians 6 says, starting, like I mentioned, in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And so we have an enemy. The Bible calls this enemy the devil, which means the accuser. In other places in scripture, the enemy is called Satan, which means adversary or opponent. We have an enemy. Now, the devil can create all, ki all kinds of fear and just, we've all had some kind of experience with this, this idea of the devil and what he might look like, you know, the pitchfork all the way to, you know, the horrible things you might see in media. And so I feel like today, before we go any further, we need to demystify the devil. I think it's important for us to understand the opponent we're facing. So I've shared this before, but um, I played football at UAB. And now I know you might expect that I was the quarterback. In fact, the quarterback when I was playing is right here on the front row, my friend who was my roommate, Thomas. He looks like a quarterback, I don't. So anyway, so I was not the, quarter, I was not the tight end. I didn't start on defense. I know this may be disappointing for some of you. I was the long snapper. All right, thank you. I got a clap right there. Praise God. <laughs> Only three people were clapping because some of you are like, what is a long snapper? Did he just make that up? Is that really on the team, all right? And, and so anyway, the long snapper was, was the guy on the team um, that is truly, honestly, the hero of the whole, the whole game. <laughs> so I just don't have to so. But on punts and extra points, I was the guy that like, y'all, I could do it right now. If I, had a if I had a football right now, <laughs> come on. Anyway, so I snapped the ball back for punts and extra points. And so that, 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 that was my position. It was awesome to be a part of the team and to celebrate everybody else. And you know, never get any celebration yourself. That was amazing. <laughs> and, and you know, cause the whole goal of a long staffer is that people don't know who you are. Cause if they know who you are, you messed up. <laughs> I'll prove it. Name the long snapper on your favorite team right now. And you can't do it. Pray for them, please. Anyway, all right. So, <laughs> and so I played at UAB, which by the way is the godliest team in America. And so you want me to prove it? We, we lived, we died, we were resurrected and now we live again. <laughs> Alabama and all of them. All right, so, so I, pl I played at UAB in the BC days, all right, so before all of that. And in the BC days, we had literally some of the worst facilities in America. In fact, like our facilities were probably not even as good as my like 2A high school. So, but we had this film room right off University Boulevard that every week we would play on Saturdays and then we would come together on Sunday and we would watch film. So we would watch film for the team we just played. And yes, even the long snappers would watch team, film for the team we were about to play. And the whole goal was before we practiced that week, we would understand who our opponent is and who they're not. So if you'll allow me for a moment, we're gonna let God's word be our film study today, all right? And so if you're taking notes, let's make sure we understand who our enemy is and who the enemy isn't. So here, here's who the enemy is. We're gonna look at Ezekiel for this uh, and then also in Isaiah for this, uh, for this teaching. So it says, you were anointed as a guardian cherub. So the enemy, the devil, was originally created as this guardian angel. For, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the fiery stones. We so had an, even an intimacy with God. You were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created. And I highlighted that, and it's important just to, to know, and we'll come back to this later, that, that the enemy is a created being. Till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled. So you, he was created as this beautiful guardian angel with intimacy with God, but he was filled with violence and ultimately he sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you. So he was this created guardian angel who had intimacy with God, was filled with sin, and then God expels him out from heaven. We'll look also into Isaiah. It says, oh, how you have, how, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. 
you said in your heart, now this verse gives us a lot of insight to the sin that we, we heard earlier in Ezekiel. What was the specific sin of Satan? It was the I will sin, it was a sin of pride. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. The ultimate sin of Satan and why he was cast out is in his pride, he wanted to take God's place. And he said, I will. And come on, somebody. God said, oh, no, you won't. <laughs> and he was cast out. And here's what we need to know is that since that moment, Satan exists. If God is for it, Satan is against it. He stands against everything God stands for. Satan, the devil, stands against. And the Bible gives us lots of names to characterize who he is and his agenda. He's called a liar. He's called an accuser, an adversary, a tempter a destroyer, and then this last one's a big idea of Satan, and we're gonna come back to this later on too, is that he ultimately is a deceiver. Write this down, this is who he is. He exists to destroy God's children and defame God's glory. That's who Satan is. Now, who isn't he? And this is a lot more fun to talk about. So to frame this, I wanna share a quick, just a quick story uh, because it was so big in my life, and I'm praying even today, this, what I experienced in this story will mark your life. So. I got saved when I was 17 years old and, and it was a miracle. And I don't ever wanna just like say that and move past that. I still can't believe God rescued me. Come on, anybody out there, you know who you were before the cross of Jesus Christ. I was full of so much fear and doubt and confusion. And I was 17 years old and a friend invited me to church. And I went into that church really for a lot of the wrong reasons. But there in that environment, God met me. And on the side of the road one night, driving home from church, I gave my life to Jesus and I have never been the same. It hasn't always been up. I mean, there's been ups and downs. And, but let me tell you something, that night, 17 years old, God changed my life. Come on, if God has changed your life, if you've experienced the grace and mercy of God, yeah, let's give God praise. Just never move past our salvation. The greatest miracle of all. So I'm 17 and I just fall in love with Jesus and I want as much of Jesus as I can get. And so, you know, church every week. And then the summer after I got saved, um, I went to a summer camp and the speaker at that camp's name was Junior. And he was just a, for me, especially at a young age, was just a huge example. He played soccer at AUM. So he was an incredible athlete and just loved God. And he had this habit. In fact, all summer long, I, I asked if he could mentor me. He ended up allowing me to travel with him some to different places where he was speaking, different camps, disciple nows and beach retreats and all these different things. And he just had this habit of spending hours every day in God's word. I mean, he called it breakfast. He's like, I gotta go eat breakfast. I gotta eat the word of God. And he would spend two, three, four, five hours every single, I'm not joking with you, in God's word. He could, in fact, he could recite entire books of the New Testament out of memory. That's how, how he was just feeding on God's word. And he, he helped me understand like the macro story of scripture and how the Old Testament is found in the New Testament and how the New Testament was prophesied in the Old Testament. And I'm, so the moment, I'll never forget, we're sitting down talking about the devil one day and I'm so confused about all of that. And he played this game with me and I wanna, I wanna play it with you guys. And you've, you've probably played it before. It's the opposite game, all right? So I wanna, let's, let's do this out loud. I'm gonna say something. I want you out loud to say the opposite. Y'all got it? All right, say, so uh, up, Down. hot, oh. when, Lose. Lose. <laughs> left, <laughs> right. All right, now this next one, don't say out loud, but I want you to say it in your mind. God. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I said out loud, Satan. And immediately Junior was like, oh, no, 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 no. God has no opposite. <laughs> Our God has no opposite. You wanna see it in God's word? Come on, this is gonna fire somebody up right here. Jeremiah chapter 10, no one is like you, Lord. You are great and your name is mighty in power. Our God has no opposite. And that's, you wanna know anything about the enemy, you need to know. He's a created being who doesn't even come close to our God. We are not an Eastern religion. We don't have a yang to our yin. We have a God who is almighty and a devil who isn't. Can I get a better amen in God's house today? We have an enemy. But he is what he is and he's not what he's not and he's not God. He's not omnipotent. He's not all powerful. He's not omniscient. He's not all knowing. He's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at one time. Him and his, and his, and his minions, his, the demons, they are limited in their power. If you wanna write it down, just write it down and get this, come on, in our hearts, in our minds, and ultimately in our habits. 
God is almighty, Satan is not almighty. And we gotta start there just knowing who God, who God is and who the enemy is. God is almighty, Satan is not almighty. Here's the second truth, and this one, this one again, this is heavy, but it's real, and we gotta understand that we have an enemy. Second foundational truth is that we are in a battle. In Ephesians 12, back to, or Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, talks about this battle, and, and there's really a lot of language throughout the New Testament around fighting and warfare. There's a ton of, just Paul especially writes about being, you know, fighting the good fight and being a soldier, and here he uses a different word. He says, for our struggle, everybody say struggle. It's not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. So we are in a battle and it's not against people, we gotta be sure we know that, but it's against powers and authorities. And that word struggle is important because when I, for many years, and even now sometimes I'm tempted to think about spiritual warfare as an every so often kind of situation. Like it's almost even in my mind, it's like, you know, there's these battle lines drawn and there's like the, the, ba- the army of God and there's like the army of the enemy and every once in a while the enemy's hurling like a missile over and, you know, we're, we're shielding ourselves and every once in a while we're hurling a missile that way and it's this kind of like a, a, a warfare that's happening like in that kind of battlefield World War II mindset. But that struggle word paints a completely different picture and it's, 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 a, it's the word really in the original language of like a wrestling match. And this tells us a lot about the battle we're in. We gotta be real about this. This is a hand-to-hand, face-to-face, wrestling match with the enemy. It's intimate and it's personal. The enemy, whether we like it or not, is coming after us and he does not stop. It's not every so often. It is all the time, wrestling match, the enemy coming after us. We just gotta be ready for it. So my my boys, um, I have four boys, they all play sports. Right now they're all playing football. And I don't know about y'all, I was the parent who honestly threw shame at parents. I'm like, I'll never be at the ball field every night a week. Here I am years later, I'm at the ball field every night, pretty much. Come on, parents wave at me, where y'all at? Like four nights a week, we're at the ball field. We're that family and honestly, I love every second of it. And I love, I just love this season of, of life. And, and so we, we have three of our boys are in like tackle football and then we have one, our youngest, that's still in flag football. And Knox is our youngest. He has gone through seasons, and even now, like he, he has a ton of ability, but he doesn't, he's not super aggressive. And I just feel like if we're gonna play, we gotta play. Like on a scale of one to 10, if one is like, I don't care about sports, and 10 is like, I get arrested at the sports field, some of y'all need to repent. I'm like a seven. And Jill's okay with that around the tackle football. She thinks the seven's a little too extreme with flag football. Cause like we're on the way, cause I'm like trying to get Knox pumped up, cause I want him, I want him to get out there. And this is life or death. This is flag football, son. We got a win today, so this is true. I actually have created like a compilation video of all these like like motivational speeches and like highlights of film, and I play that sucker loud in the car all the time. And the last of those, all of those, ends up with this this video that's all about a dog fight. And it's like you're gonna dog fight. And I'm like Knox, we're in a dog fight. He's like, yes, sir, dad. I'm like, it's, listen, they're coming after your family tonight. They're coming after your future. It's a dog fight. Come on, look at somebody and say, it's a dog fight. It'll fire you up. Hey, I was Coach Prime before Coach Prime was Coach Prime. It's a dog fight. I'm like, Knox, it's a dog. Get out there and play. Can I tell you something? Spiritual warfare, it's a dog fight. And we wish it wasn't, but it is. It's a dog fight against temptation. The enemy's coming after your family. It's a dog fight. It's a dogfight against anger. It's a dogfight against worldliness. It's a dogfight against discouragement. It's a dogfight. Whether we like it or not, we're in this hand-to-hand, face-to-face combat. And the enemy's coming after us and we gotta gear up for what's happening in the spiritual realm. Or honestly, we'd be foolish because this, whether we like it or not, it's happening. Here's what Billy Graham said about spiritual warfare. He said, spiritual warfare is not an option. It's a necessity. If you're a child of God, you're in a battle for your faith. If you don't have time to write that down, write down the message remix. It's a dog fight. <laughs> Billy G. It's a dog fight. So we have, we have an enemy. I couldn't write Billy Graham. It felt like heresy to like put his name on that. Anyway, anyway. So we have an enemy. We're in a battle. But anybody want some good news? Yeah. Anybody, anybody want some good news today? Yeah. Oh, this is the best news. We fight from victory. And if there's ever been a chance to clap in church, that is it right there. We don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. We don't fight for victory, 
We as the children of God have nothing to fear because we fight from victory. Why can we say that we fight from victory? Why is that true? Because we have Jesus on the cross, who by the way, did not go to the cross to win victory for himself. He always had victory. He went to the cross to win victory for me and for you. And the entire book of Colossians, but especially the first three chapters, in fact, I wanna teach a message on this soon because it's such a powerful truth about the supremacy of Christ. But in chapter two, are, these are powerful verses for us to get in our hearts today. It says, when you were dead in your sins and, your uncircum- and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, making sure here we understand that without Christ, we are dead. There is no hope for a dead person. Just highlighting again, as Paul often does in his writings, Before Jesus, it was death and we had no hope. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us of all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. So we deserved the charge of death. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory and we deserved all the punishment that would come with that, but Jesus, which stood against us and and, and condemned us, Jesus has taken it away, nailing it to the cross And having, here it is, now remember Ephesians 6, those principalities and authorities that are in the spiritual realm? Guess what Jesus did? He disarmed them. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public, he didn't just disarm disarm them, he spiked the ball on them. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the cross. What a beautiful, beautiful text. So the enemy, the enemy thought that he would publicly humiliate Jesus and God by putting him on that cross. But the Bible teaches us that when Jesus went to that cross, he became sin so that sin would die and that we could have life. Jesus made a public spectacle of the enemy. He hung him on a cross for all to see that death is now dead and we have the victory. So how do we live in that victory? Back to Ephesians 6, this is huge. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. And I highlighted those words, stand, and it's actually in this passage, Ephesians 6, four different times, stand. Our job, back even to that wrestling metaphor, you know, when you're in a wrestling match, there's a circle. And the goal is, if you're wrestling, to knock the person out of the circle. Hey everybody, the cross created us for a circle of victory. And the goal for us is to stand in that circle. And if we are standing firm in that circle, we have victory. Anybody ever play King of the Hill when you were a kid? Come on, the goal was knock the person off the hill. Our goal in Christ, if we stand firm on that hill and the enemy is gonna lie, deceive, all, those, all of those are just tools to knock us out of the circle and get us out of that victory. But if we will stand firm, you have nothing to fear. You will be victorious in the victory of Christ. Spiritual spiritual warfare ultimately is simple. It's actually simple. It's standing firm in the victory of Christ. Don't y'all love the Bible, everybody? Just taking what can be so abstract and even that mystical kind of far out there and just bringing perfect balance to the truth. So this is the truth. Now the question is, we got about 10, 15 minutes. How are we gonna live that out? And I wanna make sure that all of us are equipped here to step out into a crazy world that's a dogfight and be equipped uh, to live this out. So three essential practices. Here's number one. We gotta build up our spiritual strength. The first practical step to living a life of spiritual warfare is to build up that strength. Back up to chapter, or chapter six, verse 10. Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Literally tra- translated, be strong in the Lord and in the, in the might of his power. So we are strong in his strength. We don't find strength in our own strength. We're strong in the strength of God. We do not strengthen ourselves. We find our, we find our strength in God, which is why this word be is important because it says be strong. It doesn't say get strong. So getting strong in God is not about human effort. So of course, I, and I'm gonna go here and I'm just gonna go and tell you where I'm going. All the usual suspects, how can you be strong in the Lord? It's gonna be through time in his word, falling in love with the word of God. It's gonna be through time and prayer, connecting with him. It's gonna be through intimacy with the Holy Spirit, being baptized in the Holy Spirit and having the power of God alive inside of us. It's gonna be through worship and through small groups and fellowship. Those are the things that bring strength to us, but it's not us doing those things that bring strength to us. It's us receiving from God while we're doing those things that bring strength. And this is a massive change. It's, 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 here's, I woke up this morning, I went to bed last night and woke up this morning literally 
overwhelmed with prayer for a group of people that I know I have been a part of and I in continually time step back into. That is anybody in the sound of my voice, you hear something like, be strong in the Lord, and you're discouraged immediately because you're like, I have tried that. <laughs> I, have tri- I have tried to read my Bible. I have tried to pray. And I, I'm even being a faithful trier. I try over and over and over. I wanna encourage us all today. The Bible never asks us to try. In fact, it asks something completely different. And I think if we catch this, it can change, radically change our walk with Jesus. First Timothy four, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. We're never told to try, we're encouraged to train. And there's a massive difference between these two. Try is to make an attempt. And generally it's a pass fail. I'm gonna try to do this and I'll either do it or I won't do it. And some of us, myself included, approach all things God like that. I'm gonna try to do this, but man, I just keep getting knocked back down. I try and I fail. But train is a life-giving truth of scripture. Train says I'm engaged in a process of growth that will have ups, it will have downs, but overall, collectively, I'm just taking one step at a time and over time, I'm gonna grow strong in God and I'm just not gonna quit. If I don't quit, I will win. If I don't quit, I will grow in godliness. And this is what the Bible teaches about pursuing God for us to train. It, 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 you know, try and train is everywhere. We don't try to ride a bike, right? If you judge your ability to ride a bike off the first time you ride a bike, are you gonna pass that test? No your dad or your mom or whoever had to catch you because you were gonna fall and bust it. You don't judge your muscles off one visit to the gym. Although I typically try to do that. Like, oh, I'm good. You know, it's like, you know, I tried, the muscles aren't there. Okay, you know, I'll move on, right? I'm currently training for a marathon right now. And I can tell you two things about a marathon. It's the hardest thing you've ever done. And if anyone is training for a marathon, they will tell you over and over, they will brag about it. They're training for a marathon. So I'm training for a marathon right now. And, and, and here's, here's the deal. No one can try to run a marathon. You can't show up at zero and run 26.2. But yet we try to do that with things of God. No, training for a marathon, it's called training. It takes, you literally run hundreds of miles to train your body to run 26.2 at a certain moment. Can I just lift weight off somebody here? I, I, the presence of God, can I lift some weight off of you? It's not, a, it's not about getting strong in God, it's about being, it's about receiving from God and just know this, wake up tomorrow and take another go at it. Open up his word. If it's just one verse, good for you. No, you'll build on that, that's where you start. That's not where you'll be five years from now, but build on that. If you get in prayer, if it's three minutes, start there and then move beyond that. Take the weight off of you to have it all, to be it all and just let God and his strength strengthen you. All God wants is time focused with you and all those are just tools to get that so he can download his power. If y'all believe that, can you put your hands together today and just encourage anybody who might be struggling. Train, train over try. Here's here's number two, and this is the one we've all been waiting for. If we wanna live this out, the spiritual warfare uh, truth out, then we've got to be covered in the full armor. And this is, of course, what Ephesians 6 is famous for. I'm gonna read through the verses, starting in verse 14. It says, stand firm then. There's that, that stand firm is all throughout this text. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. And finally, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And I love this text. I love how practical this is. And Paul's using here a metaphor of armor, which would have been super relevant for for the, the people he's writing to because it would have given them a picture of Roman soldiers and the actual armor. He's using the pictures of the actual armor that they wore. I think it's also interesting if you love Bible study that he's also alluding back to Isaiah and I think it's chapter 11 and 59, the same armor that we see the Messiah wearing. So what he's really using a contemporary metaphor to say, hey, suit up just like Jesus is suited up. Wear the same armor that Jesus is wearing and if you do that, you will have the victory of Jesus. So I wanna go through these really quickly and these are all huge. And here's what's cool revelation is that every piece of the armor combats one of those names we talked about earlier with the enemy. Isn't God just amazing? That every attack that will come our way, God has armor for us. That the belt of truth combats the enemy's, the reality that the enemy is a liar. So the enemy's gonna be lying to us about who we are, about what we've done, 
He is never gonna stop lying. But hey, everybody, we can put on this belt of truth and Philippians 4 is a verse that I call to mind when I'm putting on that, on that belt that says this, whatever is true, that's what I'm gonna think about. No to the enemy, yes to God. We can put on the breastplate of righteousness which fights off the enemy's accusations. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. So the enemy is gonna be, a, he's a condemner. He's going to accuse us. He's gonna remind us. He's gonna point back to all the things we've done. And he's gonna say this over and over in your walk with God, you are disqualified. And over and over in our walk with God, we say back to him, oh no, I'm not, because I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And my heart is protected from those accusations. The third piece is the shoes of peace. And I love this one because it helps us fight against something that we're all facing and that is temptation. And those shoes that the Roman soldiers would actually wear weren't just shoes, but they also had spikes on them and they had spikes so that the soldier could dig down in the dirt and not yield ground. And God is saying, we have that same thing. Is that every time the enemy says, no, 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 go to the right, go to the left, give into this, we can dig down and that let the peace of God that transcends all understanding overwhelm us and know this, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation will ever overtake you. God will always make a way out for you. And I can stand firm in the onslaught so that I can fight back with that truth. God is going to make a way out. I don't have to say yes to this. I can say yes to God. We can take up the shield of faith, which fights off the adversary, the enemy. Isaiah 40, 54, 17, one of my favorite scriptures, no weapon formed against me will prosper. There'll be lots of weapons, but they will not prosper. And I love it when it talks about the shield of faith, it talks about how those flaming arrows are gonna come. But I love the truth of God that the Bible says that this, this shield of faith doesn't just ward off those arrows, it also extinguishes them. They don't just fall to the wayside, they are put out in the name of Jesus. Come on, receive that promise today. No weapon formed against you will prosper in the name of Jesus. This next one is massive, maybe the most important one for us in America in 2023, that we would put on the helmet of salvation because the enemy's trying to destroy our minds. Come on, somebody, wouldn't you agree? There is a focused demonic attack against all of us, especially our young people in this generation that will come and seek to kill, steal, and destroy our minds. And come on, if we're gonna fight for a young generation, we gotta have victory ourselves. We gotta have the light to pull them out of the darkness in. So I challenge all of us daily, come on, we're gonna put on that helmet of salvation, Isaiah 26, three, my mind is in perfect peace. Y'all know you can have perfect peace. That's a promise from the word of God. How do we get that perfect peace? The rest of the verse says, because my mind is stayed on you. Every time the enemy comes in, to destroy me with anxiety or fear or worry. I'm gonna take a step back into the presence of God and I'm gonna remind myself who he is and the victory that I have. And don't miss next week when PC leans into this in the message on anxiety, it's gonna be massive. And here's the last one, the sword of the spirit, which wards off the deceiver. We mentioned this earlier, but this is the primary attack of the enemy's deceit. It's gonna be nonstop against us. And I love that the sword of the spirit it's actually the weapon that is both defensive, it can ward off an attack, but it's also offensive. That God gives us his word, just like in Matthew chapter four, when the enemy's coming after Jesus in the desert, he just kept saying over and over, it is written. The devil's like, whatever, 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 you're this, you're that, you're this. No, no, it is written. And we just call to mind a promise of God's word. John 17, 17, sanctify them, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. That God's word is a sword in our hand that can not only protect us, but can make the enemy flee. He comes at us in one direction, but he will flee in seven. This is the armor of God. But here's the truth. God makes the armor available, but only we can choose to suit up. So I told Jill, we're gonna bring a new practice, spiritual practice into my home. And I would just encourage all of you because we are living in a crazy world and it's a dog fight every day. And how it's foolish to think that I would ever walk out of the doors of my house without suiting up with the armor of God. So before I set out, come on somebody, before I set out, I'm gonna suit up grab my hands of my family, my wife and my boys, and we're gonna circle around in the morning and we're gonna put on that armor of God. And then we're gonna step out, not in fear or confusion or doubt or worry. We're gonna step out in confidence. We have the helmet of salvation. We have the breastplate of righteousness. We have the belt of truth. Come on, we have the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. And my feet are shod with the shoes of the peace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have nothing to fear. If God is for me, who can be against me? Come on, somebody, before we set out, we can suit up. 
it's a dog fight. We gotta be ready for it. And I'm just, I'm just tired of being afraid of an enemy that's already been defeated. <laughs> He's defeated. So how do we live this out? Build up our strength. So we be strong in God, we receive his strength, not get strong. We get covered with that full armor. And here's the last one. This one may actually surprise some of you. And that is that we boldly, corporately advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Still within the Ephesians 6 context of spiritual warfare, Paul continues. He says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And here's the revelation that God gave me in studying the scripture how it's continuing on from verse 18 to 20 with this idea of spiritual warfare now around the gospel. Write this down. It's that the armor defends us, but the gospel's what takes ground. And this is why there is no armor on the back mentioned of the soldier. There is no, all the armor that is in Ephesians 6 is on the front. There's no armor on the back. Why? Because we don't retreat. We take ground. We fearlessly make known the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we're doing that, we are taking ground back from the enemy. Do you want to write theology of spiritual warfare? Go read Matthew 16, where Jesus says the church will advance in such a way that the gates of hell will not prevail. We are called to storm the gates of hell with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says they can't, the enemy has nothing to withstand that onslaught. The devil doesn't prevail against our gates, we prevail against his. And we are strong when we are advancing. A weak church is a church that has given up on the Great Commission. But if we'll stay strong in the Great Commission, come on, we'll take ground back from the enemy. And that's what's been happening here for the last 22 years. Honestly, we, pe people might say, oh, what's Highlands doing? Why build a big church, whatever, whatever. And I understand that mindset, that, that's fine. But can I tell you maybe a good answer for all of us? We really aren't building a big church. We're engaging in spiritual warfare. Yeah. Right. For the last 22 years, we've been fighting for the souls, the eternal souls of people. For the last 22 years, we've been fighting for cities and building campuses. For the last 22 years, we've been launching churches and strengthening pastors and building a university. And what else are we doing? We're also building dream centers to serve everyone and even a health center that can serve the physical, practical health needs of people. That's, that's not a big church, that's spiritual warfare. And hey, everybody, I don't know about you, but the last 22 have been good, but I'm here for the next 22. We are not gonna stop. We are gonna keep taking ground to the return of Jesus because he's called us to because it's spiritual warfare and the fruit of it cannot be denied. And as a church, I want us never to forget, this is a number that honestly, every morning we should wake up ourselves and pinch ourselves, we're a part of this. Over the last 22 years, this is what's happened as a result of all of that spiritual warfare. We've seen 314,401 people receive Jesus Christ. <laughs> Can't stop, won't stop. It's a dog fight, but we're gonna suit up. We're gonna take the gospel and God is with us. Amen, everybody. Amen. Can I pray for you every location? If you would, bow your heads, close your eyes. I wanna just give us this, this space. The sermon is over, but this is a space for response. And I believe that God, because his word is faithful, has been speaking to people here today. A couple different prayers I wanna pray. The first one is kind of back to that idea of trying a group that I know is actually here today. I know, again, I have been a part of this group at one point, and that is, you have tried so hard to do this God thing and it just has not worked out for you up to this point. Maybe you've tried to, to live right. You've tried to make all the right decisions. You've tried to clean yourself up to come to God. You tried to get past your addiction. You've, you've tried so hard and you're discouraged today, online, in person, wherever you are, because you feel like you just can't get past that kind of glass ceiling in your faith. Or maybe, you know, you're here today and you've never really tried anything spiritual. You're, you're here because someone invited you or you've hit rock bottom and this is not, you know, you've been trying to live for God. This is a brand new moment for you and you're just it's kind of sitting here in, the, in God's presence in this morning. And I just wanna make space today for anyone who's in that space to leave that trying behind and to trust today. To trust God possibly for the very first time as your Lord and Savior. I wanna give a chance for anyone here today who wants to, to get truly saved to give your life to Jesus and become another part of what God's doing in his kingdom, to receive the gift that he has for you. Maybe you're that person who's tried before and you've kind of been close to God and fallen away. 
Today's a recommitment or you've never made this decision. Today's the first time ever you will step out in salvation. But I know this, God is speaking. If that's you, you know it today. And if you wanna get saved, I wanna give you that chance. If you wanna begin a real relationship, this is your moment. Every head's bowed and every eye's closed. And on the count of three, I'm just gonna give you a chance to raise your hand and respond. And after you raise your hand, we're gonna pray together. Just be bold today. One, two, three. Come on, if that's you, put your hand up. Praise God, amen. Two hands right in the front. Praise God, I see your hand. Awesome. Right there in the back, I see your hand. Come on, anyone else? Up in the bleachers, all around. Praise God. I mean, there's just, this is my favorite moment right here in the middle. Great job. My favorite moment every Sunday. If that's you and you raise your hand, or even if you didn't, just repeat these words. Just make this prayer your own. You can whisper it out loud or just pray it in your heart, but say, today, Jesus, I give you my life. Forgive me of my sins, my mistakes. I run away from all of that, God. Today, I come to you. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. And God, I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live for you for the rest of my life. God, I pray for those who just made that decision. I bless them right now in your name. The old is gone, the new has come. God, you have a plan and a purpose for them. They belong to you. And the enemy cannot steal what you've just done. We encourage them today. We as a church family fan into flame the gifts that are on their life and the the next steps that they're gonna take. We bless them today. A powerful moment. All right, last prayer today. For anyone today who's facing spiritual warfare, honestly, this is all of us. So I just encourage you to receive this prayer, maybe even open your hands there in your lap. God, right now, we thank you that you won the victory we can stand in. So no matter where we've been, whatever maybe temptation or lie that we believe, today in this moment, we put ourselves firmly in your victory and we suit up. God, I pray for the helmet of salvation over every person against the destroyer, the one that would wreck our minds. God, I speak peace in the name of Jesus. I pray for the breastplate of righteousness, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We put on, come on, put on that belt of truth right now. We stand against every lie of the enemy and we say, God, you are true. And we put our minds and our hearts on that truth. We take up the shield of faith. Every attack of the adversary is broken off of us and extinguished. We take up the word of God, your sword, and we speak against the enemy. He will flee in Jesus' name. And finally, those shoes of peace against all temptation. We suit up in your armor and we have confidence that you are with us and we walk out of here boldly in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Come on, put your hands together and celebrate all those who just made it.